Welcome, Journey Church. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Alex. I am joined by Pastor DC over there and our good friend Chelsea here in the middle. We're going to be helping you in worship this morning. But before we get started, I wanted to let you know a couple things. There will be a communication card, a digital connect card in the comments there. And so if you could fill that out, that'd be awesome. That's a great way for us to connect with you, pray with you, maybe celebrate with you, whatever, whatever goes on there. That gets out to our prayer team and we're able to pray over those requests that you put in there. There is a way to give. So uh, you guys have been extremely generous and we are very, very grateful for you. Um, but if you'd like to continue giving, you can give at journeychurchaz.org slash give, or you can text an amount to 84321. And you also should have gotten an email uh, from Journey Church this week. Uh, it's a questionnaire, um, a little survey. We're trying to gauge your comfortability on gathering again as we um, move closer to the possibility of being able to open up the church doors for gathering. Um, we'd love to hear from you. And so um, take a look at that, um, fill it out. And then if there's any other comments that you want to that you want to make to us, just let us know because we want to hear from you. And so look forward to getting that survey back from you guys. We're going to sing a couple songs. We're going to sing great things in Cornerstone. Will you worship with us?
Jesus' blood and righteousness. I did not trust the sweetest fright, but holy trust in Jesus' name. Sing that again. My hope is built. My hope is built. Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in Savior. That's our anthem this morning. That it is you alone, our cornerstone, our foundation, our solid rock, our unshakable Savior, friend, and healer, and redeemer. God, would you be the cornerstone of our lives this morning? God, would you change us and move in us? We love you and we praise you in Jesus' holy name. We all said, amen. Hey, guys. We got Carlisle coming up, teaching our last week in our All Things New series. I hope you enjoy it.
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Journey Church Online. I'm so glad you're here. I'm Carlisle, one of the pastors. Let me start off by saying Happy Mother's Day. If you're a mother, we know that you've contributed things to this world that we have no idea how important it is. You probably have no idea how important it is, but it's important. So Happy Mother's Day to you. We are finishing up our series on the book of Ephesians. We've called it All Things New. And so I have this weird analogy. I kind of have these weird analogies. I'm going to start off right there. So it's gotten really hot really quick. Um, And one of the things that I have to do this time of year is start to rearrange my schedule because of my triathlon training. You know, I got to bring up triathlons when I talk to you. So when I go running now, I have to start my runs before the sun ever comes up because it just gets too hot to run later in the day. So I have to set my alarm while it's still dark and I have to convince myself when that alarm goes off. I did it this morning. I got up. I was fully awake and I almost talked myself out of going, but I had to remember that there's some benefits to running, at least starting a run, when it's still dark outside. So the benefit number one is when it's done, you have the whole day ahead of you. It's pretty invigorating to get your workout done in the beginning of the day. I get pretty excited. I get full of energy, and it gives me a good attitude. A couple of other things that I like about it is when you are running in the dark, you can't see how far you have to go. And for me, because I don't really like running, that does good things to my head that I just don't know how far it is and I just keep running step after step. But then this thing starts to happen. The sky starts to glow and you start to see the silhouettes of the saguaro cactus and the mesquite trees and the mountains. And then the sun comes up and it's really this super glorious, refreshing thing. Every time I see that, I love it and I'm glad I got up. So here's my word analogy. As we've been taking our time walking through the book of Ephesians. That's what it kind of reminds me of. It's reminded me of things that I knew, that I had studied before. It's also shown me some new things. And what it's reminded me of is that there's some areas in my life that's kind of like I'm running in the dark. And as I go to God's word, as I've been studying and listening to the things about Ephesians, I've seen that I start to see silhouettes of things that God wants to teach me. He wants me to do differently in life. And then the sun keeps rising and it's like I'm not walking in the dark anymore. So that's how I feel about Ephesians. I hope that that's how you feel about it as well. Uh, We're in the very last section of chapter six today. And at the end of our time, I'm gonna share about seven points with you that I think kind of summarize the whole book of Ephesians. So we'll get to that. Last week, we had a great message from Pastor David. He talked about submission. And as I was talking with people this week about what they got out of it, what a lot of people said was this thing that David said to us that submission is a choice that we make. And that really was a new way to think about submission. It's a choice that enhances our life and displays Jesus in our life. And as we submit to things, our lives actually get better. And as we submit to those things, because we're submitting to people, it actually makes other lives better. So submission really is a choice. Now, when you think about that, at the beginning of chapter six, where we left off last week and where we get into it, it kind of changes it up, actually quite a bit, as we end this book of Ephesians. It's kind of a weird ending. It's a little more assertive. It's been like this instruction manual about teaching you how to live this life that God has for us. But then the way that we're ending today with Ephesians is that it ends with kind of a warning to us, kind of a charge for us to be assertive. So we're going to listen to the passage now. We have kind of a treat in honor of mothers on Mother's Day. We've asked some of our journey kids to read the passage to you. So let's listen to them and enjoy them reading this passage on Mother's Day from Ephesians chapter 6. Two, one. To end my letter, I tell you to be strong in the Lord and his great and in and in his great power, we're full of <laughs> 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 We're God's armor <laughs> so that you can fight against the devil's clever tricks. Our fight is not against people on earth. We are fighting against the rulers and authorities and the powers of this world's darkness. We are fighting against the spiritual powers of evil in the heavenly places. That is why you need to get God's full armor. Then on the day of the evil, you will be able to stand strong. And when you have finished the whole fight, you will still be standing. 
So stand strong with the belt of truth tied around your waist and on your chest where the perfect protection of, protection of right living on your feet where the good news of peace to help you stand strong. And also use the shield of faith with which you can stop all the burning arrows that come from the evil one. And step God salvation of your helmet. And and take the sword of your spirit. That sword, that sword is is potential by God. <laughs> the teaching teaching my God. Pray in the Spirit at all times. Pray for all kinds of prayers and ask for everything you need. To do this, you must always be ready. Never give up. Always pray for all of God's people. Well, that was great. I enjoyed listening to that. Hope you did. It was fun laughing through that, um, listening to them read the Word of God and have it hopefully start to take root. We're going to spend more time looking at it today, and I'll read some more to you. So at Journey Church, what we believe about the Bible, where we just read from, is that it's the true story of humankind. It's the only story that shapes and brings meaning to our lives. I believe that to be true. I believe that to be true, even with kind of this weird little passage that we just read, that we just heard. It is a weird passage. It really is. I mean, spirits, armor, that's um, practical in our day-to-day life, isn't it? Well, I believe it is. I believe all of the Bible, all of Scripture is practical for our life. If you've been around Journey for the last few months, you know that one of the things that I say, that I try to filter Scripture as I'm reading and as I'm talking with you about it, is I try to ask three questions. So that's what I'm going to do today. I'm going to ask three questions. What does this passage say about humanity? How can this passage bring meaning to my life? And how can this passage shape the way that I live? I think that will be an easy way for us to stay focused on this passage that's a little hard. It could go a lot of different places. So first question, what does this say about humanity? So here's the answer. We are in an unseen but real struggle. An unseen but real struggle. I'm gonna read, reread some verses to you. I'm gonna read um, verses 12 and 13. So listen to this. Our fight is not against people on earth. We are fighting against the rulers and authorities and the powers of this world's darkness. We are fighting against the spiritual powers of evil in the heavenly places. That is why you need to get God's full armor. Then on the day of evil, you will be able to stand strong. And when you have finished the whole fight, you will still be standing. Did you catch what I emphasized there? that it's a real battle, it's going on. It's not an if thing, it's when it's going on because we are in the midst of it. So the spirit world is a real world. It might be kind of, okay, Carlisle, woo-hoo, he's going a little crazy. Not only does he have these weird analogies, but he believes in spirits. Yeah, I I do believe in spirits. You know, it was funny, on on Facebook a couple of weeks ago, you know, when your friends, well-intentioned friends send you those surveys, answer these questions so that we can get to know each other better. Like, how many times have you gone to prison? How, how many uh, tattoos do you have? Different random things like that. Well, there was one on there, and one of the questions was, do you believe in ghosts? And I said, I believe in spirits, because I, I do. Uh, I think that most people have two reactions when you talk about this type of thing. They get all freaked out and get all scared about the spirit world, or they kind of get apathetic and like, oh, that's, uh, it's, it's not weird like I'm scared. It's weird like you're weird. It's like one or the other. But I think that there's a place, and I think this scripture is telling us there's a place right in the middle that we need to respond to the spirit world is. See, I think that there have been seasons in history in the world where it's been a heightened uh, sensitivity to the spirit world. I think that when you read about Jesus in the New Testament, there was a whole lot of demon possession that we hear about where, where Jesus took some time and took the demons and cast them out of people. Lots of stuff. That's really different than my reality right now. Probably different than yours. I've never actually seen that take place. It happened a lot in Jesus' time. Sometimes you meet people that kind of have this heightened sense of the spirit world. And sometimes that's a little hard to understand, a little hard to handle. I have had seasons in my life, two of them, where I've had a heightened 
uh, heightened season of the spiritual world. One of them was in the late 80s and early 90s. My church and like the whole world was into this book called This Present Darkness. And it was a book written about this little town that was oppressed by demons. And it was all the strategy the demons were having to try to do bad things to humans and keep them from God. I read the book and it's kind of gets you more sensitized. Like there's a demon everywhere, like behind my computer screen, there's a demon that's just waiting to try to get me to mess up on what I'm saying to you. And so I was kind of really sensitive to demons and spirits at that time. But there's another time that's even a better story when I was uh, late elementary school. And it was again in my church, we were having this big talk about demons all the time. And so I played the piano. Uh, I loved playing the piano. I played every day. And so I was up practicing the piano in the upstairs of my house. Everyone was downstairs. I was up there by myself. And I was practicing. And I heard some noises behind me that seemed pretty real to me. And I decided, I was pretty sure in the moment, I don't know if I was right or not, that it was a demon. And I knew what to do because at church we had talked about it. So I turned around and I said, I know who you are. I know what you're up to and I know what to do. In Jesus' name, leave me alone. And I went back and finished my piano practicing. That's kind of a funny little story, but I just had this increased sensitivity. So that's what my hope is today for you. Not that you do your little speech and practice what I just did when I was in like fourth grade, but that you have some right information, some empowering information about the spirit world, that it's a real battle. It's really taking place. It's not an if, it's a is thing. So I'd like to pray for us about that and then we'll jump into it more. God, we thank you that you equip us to do the things that we need to do, but we are so thankful, God, that one of the ways you equip equip us is through your son, Jesus. And today help us to get the right understanding of this unseen world that's out for us and is against you. Help us to tap into what you have to offer to help us with this battle. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. So let's talk a little bit about the spirit world then. The Bible tells us that God is spirit. So if you have a a problem understanding or believing that spirits are real, well, God's a spirit. That's what the scripture tells us. You know what the Bible also tells us is that there are parts of us that are spirit as well. And I don't think that has to be that hard to understand. I mean, let's just use some of our present reality that we're in the middle of, this COVID-19 social distancing stuff. Like right now, I'm talking to you. You're listening to me. Hopefully you haven't started your nap yet. Hopefully I'm keeping you engaged enough. And we're actually doing this digitally. You're not really here, but you're kind of here. So we have this conversation going on. I'm actually talking to a camera, but I'm imagining all of you, and you're listening, and you're kind of filtering what I'm saying, you're appropriating, you're accessing what I'm saying, try to apply it to your life, and you're probably kind of wishing that I'd get to the point of what I'm trying to make here. This is my point. Most of, if not all of, what's happening right now, particularly in you, I think, is occurring in your spirit, right? If, if it's not occurring there, then where is it occurring? So you're thinking about some things, so you might say it's occurring in my mind. You're having some emotional responses, so maybe you're saying it's happening in your heart. Uh, You're having some willful reactions, which you want to go do, hopefully, when we get done with this. Where are those things taking place, if not in your spirit? So we have to admit that there's there's a spirit world around us that we're in the middle of, this unseen but real part of the world that is around us. And so what Paul's doing here is he's dipping his toe into the pool about the spirit world. So he's telling us that it's real. He's telling us that it's organized. And he's telling us that it's opposed to Jesus. His purpose of this introduction is to create some awareness, this sensitivity, not for us to get weirded out with fear or to get weirded out with apathy that we don't believe it, but that that it's something that we can do something about. He's trying to encourage us, maybe even incite us. It's kind of like he's patting us on the back saying the spirit world stuff's okay, but he's also punching us in the shoulder to say you need to do something about this. What he doesn't do, he doesn't tell us to hide. He doesn't tell us when it comes to the spirit world to keep a low profile. He doesn't even say to hunker down or to set up like this sniper's nest where you can shoot all the unseen but real enemies around us in the spirit world. You know what he tells us to do? 
he tells us to stand, to stand. This is a forward facing posture, standing and facing the enemy. It's somewhere between a defensive posture and a punching offensive posture. It's not a hiding posture, but it's also not a besieging posture. It's a standing firm in your place posture. In this passage that we read four times, Paul uses aggressive fighting words. And four times he says to stand put, to stand strong there. So as we start off in this unseen spirit world, Paul's telling us not to be naive, that the unseen spirit world is real. He's telling us that we should be assertive and we should not lose ground. We should take a stand and not lose ground. But, but how do we do that? How do we fight against this? Well, that's what comes next. So the second question that I'd like to ask is, how does this passage bring meaning to my life? So here it is. We need to remember where the power comes from. Remember where the power comes from. So I'm going to read uh, verses 10 and 11 to you. To end my letter, I tell you to be strong in the Lord and in his great power. Wear the full armor of God. Wear God's armor so that you can fight against the devil's clever tricks. So I think that this is really good and really practical instruction to this insidious and blurry enemy that we're told is real, but that we can't see. You know what I love about this passage? This is an apples to apples fight. What I mean by that, it's a spirit to a spirit fight. And you know who they're fighting for? You. They're fighting for you. The prize in this fight is you. The spirit of God and the spirit of Satan are fighting for you. And that's the encouragement that we have. Literally, Paul wrote this. Strengthen yourself in the Lord. In the Lord. He doesn't say, Carlisle, go do a bunch of spiritual deadlifts so you can get really strong to fight against these spirit world things. No, he doesn't say that. He doesn't say, Carlisle, go run a bunch of spiritual Ironman so your endurance gets stronger so you can fight against this enemy. No, he says, be strong in the Lord, not in Carlisle. He says, be strong in the Lord. And he goes on, and in the power of his might. So what this is doing, it's showing us how to get the strength. Sometimes what we, can, what we can do is we can repeat verses a lot and there's strength and there's reasons that we should do that. But that's not what he's saying. It's not be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. That we just repeat that over and over again. Those kind of mental things can be helpful for us. But that's not what he's saying to do here. I think to understand what Paul's trying to get to, we could, it might be helpful to understand the difference between two words that the NIV and the ESV translation use, might and power. So this is what I think might is. Might is an inherent power or, for, or force. So like a muscular man's muscles display his might even if he doesn't use them. You get that? So it's like the reserve of strength or the potential of strength. Power is the exercise of might. Do you get the difference? So it's the muscles just sitting here versus if you bend an iron bar, if a strong man bends an iron bar, he's showing us his might that comes from his power. He's using the power. So power is not power. Might is not power until it's used. It's a bit a big thing here. It's not Carlisle's power it says to use. Whose power does it say to use? You, you know the answer. Anytime I ask you a question in church, I've told you what the right answer is. Jesus? It's real. That's the answer. It's in the Lord's strength, in Jesus' strength, not in yours. So what it's saying is Jesus has the power and the might for us to live this Christian life. But his might does not work if we just sit passively. Because it says that we have to stand in an active posture. Not hide, not cower, but stand. So His might works as I rely on it, as I appropriate it, as I step out and stand up. So there's a few options that we can go to. We can rely on it and do no work. We can rely on this power from Jesus and do no work. We can do work without relying on it. But that's not what we're told to do by Paul. Both of these fall short. So we must rely on his might and then do the work. And the work that we do is to stand firm on the ground that we've gained. It's not, I do everything and God does nothing. It's not Carlisle power. 
It's not I do nothing and God does everything. It's not I do all I can and God takes up the slack because he feels sorry for me. It's like this synergy thing that happens. God has the muscle and I have the initiative to take the stand, to stand firm where I'm at and the power that comes from God. So the power comes from God. We resource it. We put it on. The power is not our power. The power is God's power. This armor is God's armor, not ours. We just get to put it on. It's kind of like the, the Marvel comic. I think it's Marvel Iron Man where he's just a regular man until he puts the suit on. And when he has the suit on, he has all the strength to do these things so that we're putting on this armor, this suit of God. So how can this shape the way I live? I think that we have God's tools at our disposal. And the tools are this. It's the armor of God. So let me read uh, again to you. I'm gonna read uh, verses 14 through 18. So stand strong. There again, we have the stand with the belt of truth tied around your waist and on your chest where the protection of right living. On your feet where the good news of peace to help you stand strong. And also use the shield of faith with which you can stop all the burning arrows that come from the evil one. Accept God's salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit. That sword is the teaching of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times. Pray with all kinds of prayers and ask for everything you need. To do this, you must always be ready. Never give up. Always pray for God's people. So what I'm not going to do today is spend a bunch of time telling you what the different parts of this armor are. I'll just summarize it this way. This is what I think. I think up here when we have the head, we we protect our thinking with what we come to know about Jesus through his word and through our experience and through the church. I think that we start to protect our hearts by what we start to believe and that we need to protect that. I think we protect how we willfully behave, how we act by wielding the sword of the spirit and by wearing shoes that pursue peace. And that's all I'm gonna say about that. We're not gonna spend time theorizing with each piece of the armor. That could be fun for you to do on your own, to look into some things and read through that and, and talk about it in your journey group or in your family. So that's our tactic. Our tactic is that we put on God's armor. But what is their tactic? So I'm gonna read a quote to you from a Bible guy who quoted a Bible guy. So now Bible guy is quoting a Bible guy who quoted a Bible guy. This is what this guy said. I tell you who it was, but it wouldn't mean anything to you. It's just a Bible guy. The tactics of intimidation and insinuation alternate in Satan's plan of campaign. He plays both the bully and the beguiler. Force and fraud form his chief offensive against the camp of the saints. Intimidation, insinuation, bullying, beguiling, force, and fraud. Isn't that an attractive personality? Don't you want to be friends with that guy? So I want to focus on the bullying and the beguiling. That's uh, an easy one for us, I think, to get a hold of. So what does it mean to get bullied? What does a bully do? A bully picks on a person. A bully intimidates a person. A bully belittles a person. A bully taunts and teases a person. When you see someone getting bullied, what do you want to see them do? Not what do you want to do to the bully. I know what we all want to do to the bully. We want to strategically place a punch right to the temple that takes them out. But that's not the question I asked. Not what do you want to do to the bully. What would you want to see the one who's getting bullied do? You want to see them stand to stand up to, to not cower away, to be sure of themselves. So when we are getting bullied in this demonic thing, in this spiritual thing that's real and taking place, we can stand and we can be sure of Jesus and what he did for us and what he's doing for us, what he's doing in us, what he's doing through us, even in the moment of being bullied. You know, when you think about when you've seen people get bullied or when you get bullied, What happens when we stand firm against a bully? What happens? They move on. They move on. James 4, 7 says, resist the devil and he will flee. He will move on. So that's the remedy to a bully is we stand firm in the armor of God. What about when you're beguiled? That means when you're charmed or you're tricked into doing something that you don't think you should do or doubting something that you're sure of. I remember back in, I guess it was like year 2000, 2001, when the email scams started to first come into play. And I got an email. 
I was a church planner at the time, and our church was struggling financially. And I got this email saying this wonderful woman that inherited a large sum of money was about to die. And she picked our church out of all the churches. Somehow she just picked our church, and she wanted to bequeath us this um, fortune. And I looked at it and went, oh, Jesus, you're coming through for us. I was going, hmm, this seems weird. <gasps> no, no, no. This is Jesus' provision for us. I was pretty convinced, and I started to email back and forth. But I started to pray through it. I sought some counsel about it, and I cut it off. I told the person, you're a scammer. Quit emailing me. I was embarrassed, but I was relieved. That's the tactics that a beguiler uses, and it appeals to us sometimes, and we have to stand firm in what we know about Jesus and pray through it and talk to people through it. Other times, I think we get tricked into doubting things that we know to be true about God. We doubt things that we've come to know to be true about ourselves. We doubt things that we've come to know to be true about people that are important to us. So we are tricked into doing things that we shouldn't do and we're tricked into believing things that we shouldn't believe. And that's really their tactics. We're bullied and we're beguiled. That's their tactics. Intimidation, insinuation, bully and beguile, force and fraud. Like I said before, that's a pretty attractive list. But we can stand firm in Jesus. So Paul used a variety of terms to talk about these spirits. In the translation that the kids read for us, it called them rulers, authorities, and powers. So sometimes in a message like this, just like sometimes you dissect the armor, sometimes you can dissect these levels of forces, of spiritual forces in the spiritual world. I'm not going to do that either. Just know this. There's different levels and there's different ranks, but there is one goal. To knock you, the Christian, the follower of Jesus, down from their place of standing. At the end of the day, it's completely irrelevant which part of this echelon and hierarchy of evil forces we're facing because collectively, they're a member of the same enemy entourage. They're part of a, a spiritual army that's organized under the headship of Satan who has come to take you down so you do not stand any longer. But there's good news. There's even more orchestrated army that is on our side and has a more powerful commander who might that be? Jesus, the one whose armor we wear. I have all these verses I'm gonna share with you about that so we can be encouraged and we can stand in what Jesus has for us. Romans 8.38 says this. It tells us that the principalities cannot keep us from God's love. Therefore, there is a limit to their power. Ephesians 2, chapter 1, 20 and 21 tell us that Jesus is enthroned in heaven far above principalities and powers. Colossians 1.16 tells us that Jesus created principalities and powers. Colossians 2.10 tells us that Jesus is head over all principalities and powers. So he, Jesus is not the opposite of them. He's above them. Ephesians 3.10 and 11 tells us that the church makes known the wisdom of God to principles and palities. So God schools them. It's not the other way around. 1 Corinthians 15.24 tells us that principalities and powers have an end. One day their purposes are going to be fulfilled and God will no longer let them work. Therefore, we have to understand that right now in this present age, there's a purpose in God's plan for allowing them to do their work. Colossians 2.15 tells us that Jesus disarmed principalities and powers at the cross. Therefore, our victory is already rooted in what Jesus did, not in what we do or what we are going to do, but what he did. So he's doing his part they're doing our part, and we get to do our part by putting on the armor of Jesus. So that's that part of Ephesians chapter 6. Here's my summary of it in closing. It's God's armor. It's not your armor. We put on God's armor. We put on that armor and take a stand so we engage Jesus and God in this. The enemy tries to bully and beguile us. That's their tactics. They're organized, and they're powerful, but we're more organized and we're more powerful. So there you have it. We don't have to be freaked out and fright and we don't have to act like this isn't happening because it is. See, this is what I think about this. I think that we can't afford to not put on this armor that we're talking about because that those verses say the enemy 
is doing this. The enemy is bullying you. The, bull, the enemy is beguiling you. The enemy is accusing you and picking on you and tricking you into bad decisions and to have bad doubts about God, about yourself, about the people that are important to you. See, I think this armor thing is like the sex thing we talked about a couple of weeks ago. We talked about a sexual ethic and we said this, we encourage you to talk to your kids about sex because sex talking is out there. It is going on. Spiritual warfare is out there. It is going on. We can't act like it's not. And so the remedy is to take a stand and put on God's armor, even if it's as simple and crude as I did that day when I was practicing the piano. My friends, ignorance, when it comes to this, it is not bliss. You know what ignorance is? Ignorance is naive. Ignorance is careless. Ignorance is lazy. And so is oversensitivity and paranoia. So the antidote is putting on God's armor and taking a stand. So that's the end of chapter six. Next week, when we get together, we're gonna start a new series on a prophetic book of the Old Testament called Habakkuk. You can practice saying it. It's kind of fun to say. This series is gonna be called Waiting in the Dark, Trusting God Through It All. Can you relate to the waiting part? Aren't we all waiting for this COVID thing to end? But that's not what we're gonna talk about, about waiting for that kind of thing. This is the waiting that we're gonna talk about. Have you ever wondered in your life if God's just kind of taken a nap? Have you ever thought that maybe God's just bored with me. I don't think he's around much anymore. Or maybe he just doesn't like me much anymore. We're gonna learn that that's not the case. We're gonna learn that while we're waiting for God, God is being faithful and he's being loving toward us and he is still working out a plan that we get to be a part of. It's gonna be a great series. I'm looking forward to hearing about it um, and teaching part of it. You're gonna love it. It's gonna be a great journey to get to the part of the Bible that we don't get to too often one of the prophetic books in the Old Testament. But before we move on, I told you I wanted to give you a quick summary of where we have been in Ephesians and give you a challenge. The challenge will be obvious. It's the same for each one. First thing, we learned that you are a child of God. You are. No matter what other people say about you, no matter what your past says about you, no matter what you say about you, you are a child of God. Do you believe that? Do you act like you're believing that? Our identity influences our behavior. So your identity as a child of God is set, and what you believe about your identity influences the next things that you do. Do you believe that about your identity, that it's influencing your behavior? Are you behaving like you believe it? Third thing, God has a great plan that you are a part of. See, God's plans, they're steeped in love. They take into account the difficulties that we're in the midst of, no matter what their causes are. But he has a good plan, and we can be a part of this big plan of things getting better. Do you believe that? Are you acting like you believe that? Following Jesus and following the word of God, this changes your life. I say it all the time, following Jesus and following the Bible, there's no better way to live. You can't go wrong if you follow this. It's a guide for a good, righteous, and blessed life. Do you believe that? Do you act like you believe that? God's Spirit is our ongoing guide for life. As a believer and follower of Jesus Christ, God's very spirit, it says in scripture, resides in this commingling with us. The spirit of God commingles with you, guiding you in and out of things that are a part of his plan, his good plan. Do you believe that? Are you acting like you believe that? And then today, there is an ongoing battle to fight in the Christian life. Apathy or paranoia, don't protect us from an unseen but real conspiracy against your soul and against your life with God. God's armor equips us to take that stand. Do you believe that? And do you act like you believe that? So I want you to do me a favor. Which one of those grabs you the most as we summarize this journey that we've taken over the last couple of months through Ephesians? Which one of those grabs you 
the most. Pick one of those. I think it's important for us to be articulate. I think it's important for this Ephesians thing, this study we went through tonight, to evaporate out of your life. Pick at least one thing. And will you do me another favor? That Connect card that you can virtually fill out, put down on there what is the one thing that you're taking from Ephesians. We have a prayer team. By tomorrow afternoon, they're gonna be praying for you about that one thing. So let's take what we learned over these next weeks and let's do something. Let's be articulate and let's be praying with each other about it. Would you pray with me? God, we thank you that you care about us so much that you give us warnings, that you give us equipment. We thank you that you are the equipment. Help us not to uh, be fearful about this battle that we're in the middle of. Help us not to be apathetic and careless and lazy about it. Help us to have some ground right there in the middle that we have this relationship with you that has equipped us already. So help us to move forward with these things that we've gained in Ephesians. Remind us of the things that you wanted to remind us of during this time. We know that your word can transform our lives. And I pray, God, that the study through Ephesians would be transformative for all of us that are listening. It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray this. Amen. Thanks for being here today. We'll see you next week.